All right, well, we can go ahead and get started if you all are ready. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I'm Christine Mallins and director of the Center for Social Science Scholarship, which coordinates our annual Social Sciences Forum lecture series. This is our third Social Sciences Forum lecture of the semester. It's also the Department of History's annual low lecture, and I want to thank everyone in the department for organizing the event today. Before we begin, I want to take a brief moment to mention our fourth lecture on four, uh, at 4 p.m. on Tuesday, April 6. Dr. Candace Brown of UNC Charlotte will be giving a talk called The Motivation to Exercise in Age, organized by the Erickson School of Aging Studies. You can find more information on our website, socialscience.umbc.edu. I'd also like to invite you to engage with us on social media. We're on Facebook and Twitter at UMBC Soci and on Instagram at cs3.umbc. Uh, last but not least, a few housekeeping details. So attendees are muted with your video off for this lecture. We welcome your comments and your questions for the speakers. Just put those into the Q&A box at any point, and we will address those following the moderated discussion. Thank you all so much again for being here, and I will turn things over to Dr. Amy Freud, Chair of the Department of History. Thank you, Dr. Mallinson. Um, I'd like to thank the Center for Social Science Scholarship for sponsoring this year's low lecture. Um, we appreciate their support. Um, as Dr. Mallinson said, I'm Amy Freud. I'm a professor in the History Department, Chair of the History Department, and I'd like to welcome you all here. Uh, one of the silver linings of COVID is that we can expand our audience and have friends and colleagues join us from beyond the borders of UMBC. So uh, I hope to see uh, names in the audience that we, we know from, from past years. Um, and we're, well, we're very happy you can join us for this event this year. Um, the History Department annually holds the Low Lecture to honor our former colleague, uh, Professor Wilfred Augustus, or Gus as he went by, Lowe. Lowe earned his PhD degree from the University of Iowa in 1941. And like many men of his generation, he went on to serve in World War II as an infantryman in Italy. After the war, he came back and became professor of history at Maryland State University, what is now known as University of Maryland Eastern Shore. And he taught there from 1948 to 1966. His doctoral dissertation was entitled Virginia in the Critical Period, 1783 to 1789. And from that, he developed an essay that he submitted to the Virginia Magazine of History and Biography. This was in 1950. Both the editor and the publications committee thought that his article was excellent and that it deserved publication, but, and I quote here, since Professor Lowe is a Negro, end quote, they sought formal approval from the executive committee of the Virginia Historical Society to see if this essay should be published. Uh, to their credit, the committee members accepted the essay on its merits and thereby quietly broke an academic color line that was clearly evident at the time in other historical organizations and journals. Lowe published several other essays, but he became best known in the academic world as the fourth editor of the Journal of Negro History from 1970 to 1974, and he was co-editor of the authoritative Encyclopedia of Black History, which appeared in 1981. But most important for UMBC, in 1966, he left UMES and he became the founding member of the history department at UMBC. He was our first chair and he helped build the history department to uh, an enviable reputation by the time he retired in 1984. So our annual lecture commemorates the quiet but profound influence of this early champion of Black American history. And each year we like to invite the best and brightest historians of Black history, the US South and slavery to continue to teach us. That is definitely what's gonna happen today. For the first time, I'm very excited to say the low lecture will actually be a panel. And we have a, an esteemed uh, group of panelists with us today. First, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Sharika Crawford. Dr. Crawford is Associate Professor of History at the nearby U.S. Naval Academy. So she's a, a local Marylander. Dr. Crawford earned her PhD at the University of Pittsburgh and her areas of specialty are modern Latin America, the Atlantic slave trade and race and ethnicity in Latin America. She's the author of a new book, The Last Turtleman of the Caribbean, 
Waterscapes of Labor, Conservation, and Boundary Making, and of many articles and book chapters in both English and Spanish, by the way, on both her historical research and the teaching of history. And we were just saying we're going to have Dr. Crawford back with us to talk about that book because we want to hear more about it. <laughs> Our first uh, speaker today is Dr. Vincent Brown, and he is the Charles Warren Professor of American History and Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. Dr. Brown earned his PhD at Duke University, and his areas of specialty are Atlantic history, African diaspora studies, and the history of slavery in the Americas. Some of you may know Professor Brown's first book, which was The Reaper's Garden, Death and Power in the World of Atlantic Slavery, which came out in 2008. But the most recent book of his that he's going to be discussing out of his many publications and media uh, <laughs> creations is Tacky's Revolt, The Story of an Atlantic Slave War, which came out in 2020. Our second speaker is our own Dr. Mari Lane Cars. She is Associate Professor of History and the former chair of the History Department. And like Dr. Brown, Dr. Cars also earned her PhD at Duke University. Full disclosure, so did I. Uh, so her areas of specialty uh, are early American history, as many students here know, Atlantic history, and women's history. Her first book, Breaking Loose Together, The Regulator Rebellion in Pre-Revolutionary North Carolina, came out in 2002. She then switched fields entirely, and her most recent book, which we're discussing today, is Blood on the River, A Chronicle of Mutiny and Freedom on the Wild Coast, which was published just last year by the New Press and just came out in a Dutch edition um, in the last few months. So. I would like to turn things over now to our panelists for what I sure will be a fabulous discussion of race and rebellion in the Caribbean. Thank you, uh, Professor Freud. Um, I just want to take an opportunity to quickly um, thank um, Professor Cars and Professor Brown for allowing me to join you in a conversation um, about your work. Um, I've read them both. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and to hear you engage one another and, and to share with our audience and participants today some of the ideas that you laid out um, in these really game changing changing books for our field. I'm going to start off with sort of a, an opening question that's sort of basic. Um, how did you both come to write on works regarding um, slave rebellions in the 18th century Caribbean? And could you share with us all what you think are the most important um, findings, um, discoveries in that work. And uh, perhaps um, maybe we'll start with um, Professor Brown first and then Professor Cars. Well, uh, let me first thank um, Professor Mounts and Professor Freud for the, those very generous uh, introductions. And, and I'm really happy to be with you all uh, in, in whatever medium and on whatever platform we have to, we have to be uh, so that we can be in conversation. And, and, and Dr. Crawford, thank you very much for hosting this conversation and moderating for us. Um, one of the reasons I'm so pleased to be with you is because uh, it makes me very happy uh, and honored to, to be in conversation with Professor Marlene Cars. Um, as you indicated, we both were trained in the Duke University History Department at roughly the same time or you know, within, within the same period. And I think that in many ways, like us in conversation kind of really allows you to throw kind of what's similar about these books and our approaches to them and what's different into really sharp relief. We were both trained in a department that was, I'd say dominated at the time by social historians, where the, the basic assumption was that social movements make the world go around and that you know one should, if they could, look for ways to think about history and, uh, and social history from the bottom up, right? So not just kind of taking the perspectives of the elites, uh, just taking the perspectives of those literate folk who may have left, might have left voluminous sources, but really trying to think about those non-literate people, those people with less formal power, right? And their self-activity and the kinds of organizations that they put together that happen to make history and make historical transformation happen. So kind of we were very much, very much made in that same mold. Um, one of her advisors, Peter Wood, was also on my dissertation committee. I think she also, you know, uh, uh, took courses with David Barry Gaspar, who was my advisor. And there was, you know, Lawrence Goodwin and Bill Chafe and all of these people kind of working on social history from the era of slavery all the way through the era of civil rights. 
And what that meant for us graduate students at Duke during that period was that we were all together talking about a very long black freedom struggle, right? And it wasn't exclusively black. That, you know, it intersected with the freedom struggles that were happening, say, in the American Revolution. They were happening, say, kind of in Latin American, uh, uh, among working class populations in Latin America. So we share that perspective. Um, I, when I kind of started thinking about this book, uh, to get directly to your question, I knew that Tacky's Revolt was an important event, but we didn't have a single book on Tacky's Revolt. Most historians um, focus still on Edward Long's account of the event from 1774, from his three-volume history of Jamaica. Uh, and Edward Long was a slaveholding planter who, um, as you might understand, hated the rebels, <laughs> hated Africans, largely hated black people, and gave us a kind of very racist account interpretation of those events. Um, that was followed by a number of articles, including most famously Michael Creighton's article on, on Tacky's Revolt. But we didn't have a book on the subject, and I thought that it needed um, a really a kind of a, 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 an in-depth treatment from that social historical perspective that Professor Cars and I both developed during our training at Duke. So that's kind of how I decided to write the book. What I found when I looked at things from that perspective and, and, and kind of set Long's interpretation at least to one side, not to ignore it, but to work around it and to try and figure out how Long's interpretation of this event of these events were actually emerged from the events themselves. So that required moving out to a number of other sources. Most helpful were uh, military sources, um, diary sources, uh, plantation records. But what I didn't have, and what I think you'll hear distinguishes my account from Professor Carr's account of a similar rebellion in the 1760s, um, is trial records. And I actually still think that maybe there are some trial records out there somewhere being held by someone and they're going to appear and then I'm going to have to write a whole other book or help other interpretation once I have them, but I didn't have those. So I had to kind of work around that absence of those trial records and, you know, paint the story on a broader canvas. Um, my findings from that were mostly that, you know, Tacky's Revolt and the events surrounding it, A, weren't just one event that it was a whole series of events in 1760, 1761, and then extending through the 1760s, that one could uh, link up with contemporaneous happenings in Africa. And in this, I was building on the work by people like John Thornton and Paul Lovejoy and other Africanists who have urged us to see what's happening with African-American history during this period as an extension of African history. But even in that assertion, what they didn't often or they didn't often or always do was to say, okay, here's how African history plays out in the Americas, but with its distinctive American dimensions. And what I wanted to do was join up the Americanist approach with the Africanist approach and tell that kind of larger transatlantic story, really follow my, my participants from Africa to the Americas so that I could see the reverberations of African history throughout the Atlantic world and especially in the Americas. So that's, that's kind of really what I found is a, a synthetic story that could tie the world together, at least the region together geographically in the way that the book does. Professor Cars. Great. Well, thank you too, Vin, uh, Dr. I mean, Professor Brown, for, for being here today and uh, to Professor Crawford for having agreed to moderate this. Um, and uh, Professor Brown now has already laid out sort of our, our shared roots to some extent. So I'll just tell you that after I finished a, a book about the American Revolution, I was really ready to branch out from English America. I wanted to do something on the Dutch since I am Dutch. So I went to the archives in the Netherlands, started poking around, found this, all these records about a colony called Berbice. I had never heard of it, uh, even though it was a Dutch colony. And within it, all these records about a slave rebellion. And I remember uh, running to the email uh, machine, it was still a machine in the archives, and emailing Barry Gaspar and saying, Barry, I'm here in The Hague. I found all these records about this place called Berbice, and it's a major slave rebellion it goes on for a year have you ever heard of it and he wrote me right back 
which was unusual. And he said, yes, I, uh, I have heard of it, but we know very little about it. It comes at an important time. Nobody can read Dutch. If, if you're willing to do it, go for it. So I did. Uh, I decided that it fit with my interest in rebellion and in revolution. I had done a field with Professor Gaspar in African diaspora history uh, and one with Ray Gavins uh, in, uh, in African American history. Um, and I and it fit with wanting to do something in the Dutch Atlantic and 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 I was sort of keen to make a contribution to Dutch awareness of their own history uh, in the Atlantic world, which is rather undeveloped. And so so I did and uh, I it's been a really moving journey uh, and it's also been an exciting journey because as Dr. Brown pointed out, I have very rich records about 900 interrogations to draw on, plus about 15 letters, the governor of the rebels and the governor of the Dutch wrote back and forth to each other. Um, and so in the end, what those kinds of records allowed me to do was uh, look at the internal dynamics of rebellion. It really allowed me to show what rebellion looked like day to day, not only for rebel leaders, but for the ordinary rank and file, all the people who sat on the fence, including and, and also the people who dodged the rebellion, the dodgers, as I called them, people who who did not really want to join, as well as a few folks who remained loyal to the Dutch. Um, and, and so what I found in the end is that slave rebellion was as complex in many ways as the American Revolution. It was not only an anti-colonial struggle like the American struggle against the British was, but it was also a struggle among the enslaved or now self-emancipated people about what the future was going to look like. And while we might think that enslaved people would have all had the same perspective and the same wishes, that was not the case. People were divided by status, by uh, gender, by where they were born in Africa or in the new, new world, by ethnic affiliations that had begun in Africa but coalesced in, in the new world. Um, and also because people had deeply different political visions. And I think that the kind of sources I had allowed me to expand on those visions and, and we can talk about them later. But but I was really struck in rereading uh, your book, uh, 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 Professor Brown, rereading it, especially this week by even though our sources are so different, we're finding very similar political visions. I may be able to put a little bit more flesh on those bones in that respect than, than you can, but but you too found similar divisions between leaders who had potentially the idea that they wanted to start sort of their own colony that would engage in trade, that would use forced labor if necessary to get people to grow these crops, and lots of ordinary folks who were like, I want no part of that whatsoever. I want to do my own thing. We want to do our own thing. We want to be left alone. And so um, it, it, it showed me that even though we have different approaches and a very different source base, we, we had many similar findings. That's one place where I think that, you know, our, our common training helped us, right? Because if one starts from the perspective of the slaveholders and the state or the empire, then one can see an undifferentiated mass of enslaved rebels, right, rising up against the, the duly constituted authority. But if one starts where we generally do among those people, trying to look at their aspirations, their struggles, not just their rejection of the powerful, but what they want, their positive aspirations, when one begins by study, taking black politics seriously, taking yes. working class politics seriously, one has to see those divisions. One has to see those fissures. One has to see those different aspirations as well as the common rejection of, 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 of imperial authority. So um, I do think that, that in, some place, in some ways that comes from our common training, even though, as you say, we had very different sources and we were able to, to you know, develop those ideas um, in different ways. I do think that yeah. we have similar assumptions that allowed us to see those things. 
Yes, and to look well beyond uh, seeing uh, uh, the rebellion of enslaved people as not just a conflict between slaves and masters, right. but but as much, just like the American Revolution was an anti-colonial struggle, as much as a, a struggle among the people who were trying to reject that slavery and reject those Europeans. Yeah. Yeah. So when we, were, when we were trained, we thought about the American Revolution as two conflicts, right? The conflict of, you know, about home rule and the conflict over who should rule at home. And so that who should rule at home was the social historian's question. Yeah. So we looked at those kinds of divisions within the colonial societies, as well as their revolt against British imperial authority. What I found when I was, when I was looking at, uh, at Tacky's revolt, and what I see coming out through your book too, is that there are wars within wars, struggles within struggles, right? So kind of one has that larger, you know, inter-imperial struggle between the Dutch and the Danish and the British and the French and the Spanish, right? That actually has its reverberations in these slave societies. But one also sees those enslaving wars in West Africa, the conflicts among Africans themselves, right? That produce so many captives for sale to the Europeans playing out in some ways in the Americas. And that's before you get to those struggles among Africans themselves in the Americas and those struggles between the enslaved and the slaveholders. So you have kind of four wars all at once. And what I decided to kind of, you know, uh, frame that as, as the kind of currents of warfare that eddied in the slave revolt in Jamaica in 1760 and 61. Yes, and you, you know, of that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, one of the things that um, is striking me um, both in your works, but now in your in your conversation with one another, and, and perhaps this might be an opportunity to um, expand our conversation to bring along maybe some of our attendees who haven't read the book. Could you do two things in your conversation next? Um, perhaps quickly sketch out um, for the larger audience um, kind of what occurred in each of your um, case studies of these slave uprisings, one in Jamaica, one in Berbice, um, then a Dutch colony, but today is a present day um, Guyana, I'm if I'm correct, um, Guyana. Um, that, that's a, I think, important component to kind of help the, the, the participants understand the differences. But then I'm struck by how you both had you know, an array of sources, of different methodological approaches, and yet you could tell us a, a lot about who these enslaved rebels were. Um, you can tell us a lot about um, their motivations. Sometimes you can tell us about their visions um, for what they were seeking to do. You can talk about the struggles. And I think that that component of your conversation um, could be really helpful in, in, in sharing your story to, to the wider audience attending today. Great. Well, let me just talk about the, kind of the, the basic introduction first, and then uh, perhaps Professor Cars can introduce the Verbeese Revolt, and then we can come back to that question of sources and how we flesh it out. And thank you, Professor Crawford, for bringing us back there, because I feel like perhaps I should have started there, but um, it's so rare that I get to geek out on slave revolt with other experts on slave revolt. So I think what you're seeing is the kind of enthusiasm for the research that Professor Cars and I share. So we just kind of launched right into that. Um, so let's pull back a little bit and just kind of start with 1760 uh, in Jamaica, which was at the time Great Britain's most profitable, most politically significant and most militarily significant colony in the Americas. Um, of the 26 colonies that Great Britain had in the Americas on the eve of revolution, Jamaica was by far the most profitable of them, right? So this slave revolt in their most important colony was an incredibly important event. Um, on April, the night of April 7th into the morning of April 8th, uh, slaves rose up on the north side of the island <clears throat> um, in what became a massive slave revolt that uh, had various phases that lasted over the course of about 18 months. Um, there were about 500 uh, slave rebels were killed, another 500 transported from the island for life, about 60 uh, white planters were killed uh, and an unnamed uh, uh, number of other uh, people of color and enslaved people who were killed and who were caught up in the crossfire. Um, and then there were a number of reverberations of this revolt afterward through the 1760s. I try to trace out you know, how the landscape remained unsettled uh, in Jamaica for that entire decade. And then what I thought were some of the consequences of the revolt itself for the British Empire. 
and very briefly, one of them was that um, the revolt was so consequential that a lot of people thought that what we ought to do is we ought to raise up a native born population so we don't have so many Africans <clears throat> in the colony. And that was an initial impetus um, uh, and justification for campaigns that would later result in the abolition of the slave trade in 1807. We also find that this revolt in Britain's most important colony was a spur to the kind of imperial reforms that Great Britain instituted for its entire empire, those same reforms which the North American colonists in the 13 colonies we know more about revolted against, splitting the British Empire in 1776. So one can see Tacky's revolt and its reverberations playing a role, right, in the, the cascade of decisions uh, that, that, that precipitated the American Revolution. It also helped to animate a certain strain of racist nationalist discourse that one sees most clearly in the text that I mentioned before, Edward Long's History of Jamaica, the three volume text published in 1774 by a survivor of that slave revolt. And that text was, was very influential throughout the English speaking world, including you see uh, that text kind of reverberating through Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia in 1785 uh, and, and other texts like that. So I wanted to see how this revolt was important in its time, but then also how its reverberations extended out through the rest of the decade or the rest of the century. Cool. And, and in contrast, Berbis is a tiny colony if there are about 100,000 enslaved people in Jamaica, in Berbice, there may be 5,000. It's kind of a backward colony, not terribly developed. Um, uh, but the Dutch, of course, had hopes. They always had hopes. It's a colony that's owned by a company of investors in Amsterdam. So it's not directly uh, ruled by the Dutch government, but the Dutch government, of course, backs this company. And this rebellion breaks out in February of 1763. It is almost instantly massive. The Dutch, it, it's a very long colony. It's about a hundred miles. And so, and the Dutch are concentrated in the middle and they begin to fear pretty quickly that they're going to be cut off from the coast and they'll all be murdered. There's only about 350 of them. And so they flee pretty quickly uh, and the rebels are hot on their trail. And so within a week, basically, the formerly enslaved people have taken over the entire colony and they stay in control of it, the whole thing, basically, for more than a year. Um, and um, there, initially, the revolt is led by a man named uh, Kofi in Dutch, or Kofi is probably his West African name. Like the main rebels in Jamaica, he is a, a Coromantee, as they're called among the English, or he identifies as a Mina, as they're called among the Dutch. People from at the Gold Coast on West Africa, who would have spoken similar languages, would have understood each other culturally, and who who create this sort of diasporic identity in the New World uh, that, uh, that that Professor Brown writes about quite a bit in his book. Um, and uh, neither the Dutch nor the rebels can really win in Berbi, so it's a bit of a standoff at some point. Governor Coffey uh, opens up diplomatic uh, um, negotiations with the Dutch, the Dutch engage in these to gain time. Coffey may well have been doing the same, but Coffey is basically saying, let's just divide this thing in two. You take the half closer to the ocean, we'll take the half closer to the rest of South America. We do want to be able to trade on the coast, however, and you do in your half what you want and we'll do in our half what we want. So he turns a rebellion clearly into a revolution at that point. But of course, the Dutch are not going to give in to this. They're way too afraid that if they allow an independent colony, then next door Suriname, which is as big as Jamaica, will fall and the whole colonial empire will crumble. So they cannot allow this. <clears throat> Eventually, Kofi is uh, is is um, displaced in a coup by uh, people in his own coalition who don't believe in negotiating, who want to keep fighting. Uh, a new leader comes to the fore, 
Eventually, the Dutch sent massive numbers of soldiers from the Dutch Republic. The rebels have no allies to help resupply them, to send them new soldiers the way the Dutch do. And so in the end, uh, the Dutch, with the help of native allies, whereas in Jamaica, it appears that the allies are mostly Maroons, the Dutch are successful uh, in, in, uh, in stamping out this rebellion. And the long-term reverberations are that the company loses an enormous amount of money. It costs the Dutch state a, a million guilders to get this colony back. And when they get it back, it's bloodied. Uh, it's most of the plantations are destroyed. Uh, a, a third to a fifth of the enslaved people have been killed, murdered, died in battle in this rebellion. And the uh, Dutch uh, government begins to think maybe us bailing out these companies that are too big to fail but don't have enough money to help themselves is not really worth it. And so over time th that feeling grows also because there is much um, rebellion in in uh, Suriname particularly among Maroons the Dutch state is just spending too much money on this and so in the 1790s they decide that they're going to do away with these private companies that had owned Berbis and owned Suriname and they take over these colonies as a as a state uh, enterprise not too long after that, though, the English uh, invade uh, 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 what is now Guyana. It becomes British Guyana, and now it's the, an independent republic. So in the Dutch Empire, too, the reverberations are, are great, although it's not merely Berbis. It's also what's happening in, in Suriname. If I could, I want to reframe or, or rephrase, I should say, the question that I want to pose to you both, because I think about you know my my relatives you know you know friends who are non academics who you know to be quite fair um, you know despite all the wonderful work of us historians they, they really don't have a, a a good handle on slavery let alone <laughs> slave rebellions and there's still a sense that there's not a lot that we can know about the experience of enslaved people let alone their agency and reading your works you are able to tell us a lot having a different set of source base, a different set of questions, a different, um, you know, local conditions from Jamaica to Berbice. And so my question to you both is um, in that context, um, taking your individual case study, your individual set of sources and kind of explaining to, to all of us how you were able to tell us about the individual um, figures that you know, supposedly we're not supposed to know about, right? Supposedly they're they're lost, you know, in you know in time because of the, the the brutality and the gruesomeness of the institution of slavery. And so when I'm thinking about these, I mean, quite you know striking examples of of resistance and agency, I'm also really interested in like how you were able to to tell those stories geographically with you know Professor Brown's stories, the geographical spans and the consequences, right, is it, tremendous. And it's very different from the very intimate um, sort of micro level case study, I think that Professor Carr's raised. So so I wanted to kind of give an opportunity to maybe rearticulate um, the direction I was going with my question regarding sources and your particular studies. Yeah, that's yeah. great. I think the most important thing there, you know, just at the kind of initial level is that you're right you know people don't know a lot about slavery you say slavery and the enslaves almost kind of disappear right and we only think about their subjection to the institution because the ideology of slavery is such that those people are mere extensions of a slaveholder or a slave owner's will that they have no personhood of their own that's the ideology of slavery I think Professor Cars and I, though, kind of start from the basic premise that slavery and the history of slaves themselves, of the enslaved, are not the same thing. And I think a lot of people don't ever get past the history of slavery and what it does to people. What it, you know, and, and it is an absolutely brutal institution everywhere you find it, right? Its impulse is to obliterate the personhood, right, of the enslaved. And yet, right, when you're a social historian, I think the first thing you assume is that that's never a completely successful endeavor, right? The powerful are never able to impose their will 
on the world completely in just the way that they would like. And where we start from is where are the limits to power? And how do people explore and exploit those limits to power, right? And I think that's the kind of major conceptual shift one has to get into to, to begin where we begin, which is let's think about the politics of the enslaved. They have politics. Let's think about slave revolt. Yes, they did revolt, right? Let's think about their own internal divisions, their own internal sense of hierarchy and personhood and struggle and beauty in a life of ugliness and pain and tragedy, right? One has to ask the question before one can even see it emerging from those sources. You never look for the sources if you don't think those are viable questions to ask. So we have to start there. I think the second thing is, especially for a lot of our American audiences, is that so much of our history is our national history. We think that, natural, that national history is the natural container for history itself. And so when you say slavery, people mostly think of the antebellum South, right? Those 30, 40, 50 years in the first half of the 19th century uh, in the Southern United States. And that for people is a vision of slavery. When you think of the colonial period, think people think of the 13 colonies, not the 26, right? Not the fact that so many of those important colonies where 90% of the population was enslaved were in the Caribbean, right? Which also happened to be where the Royal Navy was, right? The most powerful military institution of the 18th century, that's headquartered in the Caribbean. The Royal Navy, the, uh, the British Royal Navy has three major naval stations, one in Halifax, Nova Scotia, one in Port Royal, Jamaica, and one in English Harbor, Antigua. What's missing? <laughs> the 13 colonies, right? It gives you a sense of, and a, and a kind of revised sense of what's important in that colonial world. So it takes us away from that antebellum US into the larger world of Atlantic slavery that a lot of us have been studying, right? And then you get, when you have a population that's you know so overwhelmingly enslaved, uh, you get the slave trade as a fundamental part of the society. Of all the, you know, some 11 and a half or so million enslaved peoples transported to the Americas from Africa, about 400,000 came directly to North America, what became the United States. The vast majority went to South America and the Caribbean, right? Especially Brazil. So we're talking about a different kind of world than that antebellum United States already. And one has to kind of, you know, go there with the historians in order to ask the questions that I think Professor Cars and I are asking. Now, that offers us an entree into different kinds of sources. Um, these are societies in which, as I said, 90% of the population is enslaved, 90% of the population is black. In Jamaica, in the period that I'm writing, you know, anywhere from 50 to 75% of the population had been born in Africa. So we're not talking about black Americans. We're talking about people with a history that preceded that American history. And so in the case of Taki's Revolt, I'm trying to, to take that history seriously as a part of the experience of those people in Jamaica, not just pick up their, their social struggles as enslaved people in the Americas, but pick up that struggle as people who are first captive in Africa, captured in Africa, and then transported to the Americas. Think about the political history of Africa as being part of the political history of Jamaica. And for that, I wish I had had trial records that could give me the voices of the enslaved, you know, even uh, under conditions of torture uh, and, and other kinds of coercion. But what I did have is spatial records. And this became my way of inferring some of the same kinds of things that Professor Cars could write about from her trial records. Looking at the way people moved, both within Africa, across the Atlantic, and then within Jamaica, in order to infer some things about their intentions. So I spent a lot of time trying to look at where people were, right? And so the question of well, social geography really became my, my major uh, source, right? If I could figure out where people moved and how they moved, then I could make some what I think were plausible inferences about why they moved. And it was by seeing people situated in the landscape and the movement through the landscape that I was able to then begin to write about this slave revolt in some of the, you know, and answer some of those kinds of questions that Professor Cars and I have as, as social historians.
Um, thanks for, for, for that question and also for your answer. Um, I think in my case, um, because I had these 900 little minis, uh, uh, slave narratives in a way, I had an easier time talking about what it was like for people to be in a rebellion. And I, I was really intrigued by that question because my students always used to say, why don't all enslave, why didn't all enslaved people rebel? Well, because the costs were enormous. And in my interrogations, people talk about their children dying of hunger or their children being killed or their children falling ill or getting separated from their children or not being able to find their husbands or looking for their wives and getting captured or being killed by Native Americans. Or, I mean, it, it's, it's really astounding uh, what I found in those records. And so because I have these 900 investigations in Berbice. I, I was able to write indeed on a, you used the word intimate, uh, Professor Crawford, but a really intimate level about what it meant to people and how people made their choices. And I was also really interested in showing that people who did not want to rebel were not merely just fearful but that they had good reasons and fear is a good reason don't get me wrong it's a very good reason but people also had other reasons not to rebel it had to do with families it had to do with a different political vision um and so i'm able to tell many stories about many people in the book often just little stories because i can't find them for very long in some cases i can tell a longer story that really shows you from many, many different perspectives of the enslaved, what it was like. And when I give talks, I've given a number of talks on, on Zoom in Guyana, I have found there that, that people are both really eager to know more about their history and upset that they don't have those records there, that those records are in the Netherlands, that they're in Dutch. Um, and I've been able to do a little bit of brokering, uh, and now it appears that the Dutch archives are going to translate some of these trial records into English so they can go to Guyana. But I think we also need to educate young Guyanese students in Dutch and give them the money to go to the Netherlands so that they can study their own history rather than merely take the vision of a middle-aged white Dutch woman. You know, so so it's not only that that people are not always aware that enslaved people didn't have agency, but people also don't have equal access to the records. Um, and so by by writing this book for a popular audience, which means that I get less into historiography and less into abstract stuff, but tell a lot of stories, I'm hoping to both help people who have kind of a static view of slavery, see how dynamic it was and how much agency people did have even in situations of near impossible choices and at the same time i'm hoping to sort of change some minds about the dutch and give a bit of history to the to the guyanese and and entice them to go study that history themselves if possible oh sorry uh, i see a lot of questions by the way in the in the chat amy but i'm sorry Professor Brown, go ahead. Uh, Professor Crawford is muted. She, I see she's talking, oh. but she's muted. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. I didn't see that it was muted. Um, I was saying I saw so many Q&A pop-ups that perhaps this is a good time for Professor Freud to help us um, um, have a larger conversation with the participants. Professor Freud, you're muted. this already right after a year of teaching so everyone um uh please feel free to put uh, questions in the q a and we'll get to you uh, i noticed that one of our first comments um was from sheldon timmon who talks about um a recent book he or actually a not so recent book uh clr james's book about toussaint l'ouverture and the the haitian slave rebellion and i imagine that both uh professors uh brown and cars um, are aware that they're writing about rebellions that are less known than that Haitian rebellion, which comes a little later, um, and may be interested in talking about that, that relationship and maybe could recommend a, a more recent work that they also think might be of interest to, to uh, Sheldon. Uh, 
Yeah, so on uh, the Haitian Revolution itself, um, I recently read Sudhir Hazari Singh's new biography of Toussaint Louverture uh, called mm -hmm. Black Spartacus, which I, which I would recommend. Uh, and in that work, he is really trying to integrate uh, Toussaint and his politics into the study of revolutionary republicanism um, in the late 18th century. So I think that is a kind of fantastic book for thinking about the larger age of revolution and how uh, the most well-known black revolutionary within that can be seen uh, in terms of republicanism. So I think that's very important. But the you know, initial kind of um, uh, part of your question is, you know, did that book influence me? And enormously, yes. I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to write Tacky's Revolt on this larger geopolitical canvas is because I'd been so influenced by CLR James's writing of the Haitian Revolution um, in its dynamic relationship to the French Revolution, right? That for me, thinking of Tacky's Revolt as a war within other wars is another way of trying to show how it's always existing within this larger geopolitical environment. That it was, and it was hard for me to kind of, you know, fully understand this revolt simply on its own terms within Jamaica. That what I needed to do was do something of what James did and see how it was playing out in this larger world of Atlantic slavery. So one of the things that I do toward the end of the book is I essentially connect it up with both the American Revolution and the Haitian Revolution. And I talked a little bit about what I thought was reverberations on through the British Empire into the American Revolution and the campaigns to abolish the slave trade. But also, one has to remember that the history of these slave revolts in Jamaica is a history that the enslaved knew and talked about to each other and passed on that information across generations. So one interesting finding of mine was that you know, there was toward the end of the slave trade, there was one planter who had you know, bought a bunch of captives for the slave trade, anticipating the legal end of the slave trade. And these people came to his plantation on the north side of the island in Jamaica. And very soon after, they rose up and they attempted to stab their driver. And so he rounded these new captives up and he interrogated them and he discovered that they had been in contact with enslaved people on another plantation, a plantation called Frontier, that had been one of the primary plantations involved in Tacky's Revolt in 1760, and that all of these brand new enslaved Africans had heard about these revolts that had happened in the 1760s. Mm -hmm. 40, 50 years before they got there, and many, many years before any of the, the black people on the island had been born. So you see a kind of oppositional political history being taught and learned on Jamaican plantations, right? Half or half century later. That is interesting. Now, when one thinks about the fact that there were Jamaicans who were exiled from the island to places like San Domingue, and we know that one of the principal leaders of the 1791 slave revolt, revolt Pukman Dutti, had probably been enslaved on Jamaica before he reached San Domingue, we know that he was on Jamaica in a world in which that story of Tacky's revolt was circulating. And again, it allows us to kind of step back and, and get a sense of the geopolitical imagination of the enslaved that is not confined to these particular plantations or particular colonies, but actually extends out across the world. So that's something that you know, I was inspired to do from CLR James, and I think that it fits well with the story that I've told uh, it for Jamaica in, 17, in the 1760s. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, Dr. Kars, do you want to respond to that or can I ask you a question directed at you and you could respond to both? Sure, absolutely. So um, Austin uh, Adele Boss, one of our own MA students um, says, Dr. Kars, you recently released your book in your native Dutch. Austin, I hope you've read it. Um, what has the reception of your book been like in the Netherlands? And has there been any resistance to the resurfacing of the quote, uncomfortable topics of slavery and colonialism? Um, great question. Um, in the newspapers, the book has been well received, but I have gotten some interesting emails from, including from scholars, Dutch scholars, who have written me to tell me that they think my language was too politically correct. Um, one person told me that they thought my illustrations were kind of uh, empty, not you know, not not interesting. And I and I'm wondering whether um, 
whether some of these criticisms are have to do with the political situation in the Netherlands, which is that there's a lot of debate about racism, a lot of resistance, I think, among white uh, Dutch folks about the existence of systemic racism, the reality of microaggression and so on. There's this notion that racism is an American disease. It doesn't exist in the Netherlands. And it's, of course, not true. And so I think there is both a hunger among certainly people of color, but many white people too, to know more about this history. And at the same time, there is a resistance against, well, let's not be too American in, in the use of language, for instance, let's, you know, uh, so, so, the, so I think the reaction has been overall good, but, uh, and it's only been out a few months, but, but there's also been some surprising, uh, some, some surprising reactions to me. Um, and, you know, there was just a big brouhaha in the Netherlands about uh, Amanda Gorman's poem, The Hill We Climb, which was going to be translated by a young Dutch white woman writer who had just won the Booker Prize, a famous British prize. And it created a, a big stir in the Netherlands where particularly people of color were saying this would have been a great opportunity to get a woman of color who's a spoken word artist to do this translation. And to her credit, the young writer gave the commission back but there was immediately a lot of charges of reverse racism and so on and, and I think that gives you a bit of an idea of where the Dutch are at when it comes to some of these discussions which in America we've had for a longer time not that there's not plenty of issues here obviously um, but uh, but but for the Dutch this is all still a little newer I think and so I'm hoping that people will read the book and realize that, whoa, uh, we were deeply involved in slavery as, as white Dutch people, and this is a history we need to reckon with. It's an interesting comparison, Dr. Kars, yeah. Um, there's a question from Matthew Kelbaugh, also one of our students, and, and um, Dr. Brown, you, you, you touched on some of this, but I think it's a slightly different question. Was there any correlation of where African slaves were coming from and where in the Caribbean uh, the Dutch and British decided to transplant them um, or was the process geographically random? So this connection, right, between um, colonies and between different parts, of, you know, the Caribbean history being so rich and so much turnover, right, and who controls which European colonial power controls which area um, makes this a, a kind of interesting um, locale to have to, to work with. As yeah. So that's a great question. So the, the, the first thing to remember is the slave trade was not random. And yet, right, you know, captive Africans were taken from a huge swath of the African coast, really from the Senegal all the way down to the Zaire rivers and even over as far as, as from Southeast Africa and Madagascar, right, over the course of the, of the entire slave trade. And yet, when you look kind of year over year and decade over decade, there are patterns, okay, and different um, merchants, and different national powers have different kinds of relationships on the coast where they're more likely to trade at one time or another. So one of the things I focused in on was British activities on the Gold Coast, roughly what's now Ghana, where the British had a number of had an established presence um, where uh, the Royal African Company and the successive free trading merchants had kind of longer relationships and traded heavily uh, in enslaved captives from the Gold Coast. You also found the Dutch trading heavily there uh, and the Danish as well, the French for a time, uh, the Portuguese at an earlier time. But around the time of Tacky's Revolt in the mid 18th century, the British followed closely by the Dutch were the preeminent slave traders in that Gold Coast region. Now the Gold Coast, and one of the reasons I focus in on the Gold Coast, had been a particularly war-torn region of the coast with a kind of military revolution happening in the latter half of the 17th century, right? Where you had various African polities, call them states, call them empires, <clears throat> vying with each other for supremacy behind the coast, right? Now, they would often trade with Europeans for firearms to give them military advantages over their competing polities. And so one of the kind of, you know, the most sought after products of the uh, uh, from Europeans were guns, 
and the Europeans kind of traded massive numbers of guns into the Gold Coast. And what that did was it increased the scale and lethality of these contests, of these wars between different Africans, and coincidentally, um, increased the number of captives for sale to the Europeans, right? So what you see is a kind of symbiotic relationship between the weapons trade and the slave trade coming out. What that meant also in practice is that many of the captive Africans who came to the Americas had been involved in African wars, right? Many of them had been soldiers, or at least they had experience evading capture uh, in those African wars. They had some kind of military experience, and many of them a facility with European firearms. So when one sees them come out to the Americas, oftentimes you have people who had African military experience regrouping in the Americas, right? In Suriname, in Berbice, in Jamaica. Um, really from the late 17th through the first three quarters of the 18th century, Africans from the Gold Coast had a reputation as being notoriously rebellious, right? This is partly because of the political history of Africa at the time, and partly it's because of the conditions that they found themselves in uh, in the Americas. And some of the largest of these rebellions staged by these Africans from the Gold Coast were those ones in, in Suriname, Belize, Jamaica. Uh, there was a large one in New York City in 1712 um, in this period. This revolt, Taki's revolt, is one of the larger of these, what are called Coromante revolts, um, staged by Africans from the Gold Coast. Yes. Yes, and, and that also fits with uh, Professor Chuku's question about the, uh, why so much seemed to be happening in the 1760s. So it's in part because in both Jamaica and Berbice, large numbers of people from the Gold Coast are arriving. About a third of all enslaved people in Berbice are coming from the Gold Coast in the mid 18th century. It also has something to do with the Seven Years' War. Uh, and it has, uh, which is between 1756 and 1663, is creating uh, hunger in the Caribbean because supply ships are not coming through, and that creates an immediate impetus uh, for revolt. And then the whole sort of age of revolution of which these both these rebellions are at the very beginning, but which stretches through the American, the French, the Haitian revolution, and even into the wars of independence in South America, of course. Um, and so the 1760s are this very rich fermenting period in, in both the Caribbean and in, in North America and other parts of the world. And the, the rebellions that we both study sort of augur in this age of revolution that in which people will be looking at these questions of what do we want our, our lives to be? What does autonomy mean? What does freedom mean? What do I need to 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 lead uh, the kind of life that is worth living? And native people, enslaved people, poor white people, and elites are all trying to find answers to these questions, um, which is what what makes this period so so very uh, uh, exciting to study for historians. All of us know we should be studying in the 18th century, right? This is. Uh... <laughs> This is the time. Um, Anna Illichine has, uh, who recently defended her MA thesis, has a question about sources. So sources that tell uh, not necessarily about rebellions, but about resistance to slavery. And I wondered if you could talk about that, that resistance rebellion relationship, uh, both of you. Do you want to keep going, Professor Cars? Sure. Um, so, so historians have, have found that enslaved people uh, uh, resisted their enslavement uh, constantly in a variety of ways that 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 ranged from bad back talking to gossiping about your owner to running away to breaking your tools to working slower than you were capable of to actual armed rebellion um, and various people engaged in various kinds of resistance and the uh, records um, for bear beasts are incredibly rich in all of these manifestations of resistance and rebellion because there are lots of judicial records in which amazing stories are told about what people do vis-a-vis -vis each other, but also vis-a-vis -vis the, the people who hold them enslaved. 
there are little rebellions in Berbis, uh, you know, every decade. Sometimes it's just a group of people, sometimes it's a plantation or two. Most of those are relatively quickly suppressed, not always. And in the book, I discuss one that happens just before the 1763 rebellion that is uh, an uprising of an entire plantation, and it takes the Dutch six weeks to suppress them. That makes them really nervous. And all these acts of resistance and rebellion also mean that the Europeans who enslave folks know that they're sitting on a powder keg. They know that only extreme violence can keep people down and that there's going to be a moment when they're not going to be able to hold it all together and they're they're forever afraid of that. And that tension is something that enslaved people can also play with to negotiate sometimes, to get certain concessions. So it's enslavement is not merely a, a history of uh, of subjection. It is it's a power play. It's a it's a it's a, a war, as as Professor Brown calls it, in which there are retreats and attacks uh, and in which both sides, albeit with uneven powers, are able to gain certain advantages at, at certain times. Yeah, well, let me just pick that up, because I think you know, Professor Carr has mentioned that when people study resistance, we can see kind of you know, resistance happening in a variety of ways, right? All the way from these kind of like, you know, kind of quotidian, you know, everyday rejections of the power of masters all the way up to revolt and rebellion. What I wanted to do in this book was actually separate off that, you know, kind of these other kinds of resistance that we've been writing about as if one could see a, and I think one can, a continuum of resistance from full scale revolt to these kind of minor refusals and look at revolt as as warfare and see it within the terms of military history. Now, I was inspired to do this in part by, by the writing of Gustavus Vasa, who we know better as Olada Equiano, um, one of the most famous formerly enslaved uh, autobiographers uh, in the period who became a kind of, you know, a celebrity in Great Britain and a major abolitionist. And he wrote in his autobiography that when you make people slaves, you compel them to live with you in a state of war. Right. And he kind of really explicitly said that slavery itself was a state of war. I wanted to take that seriously. And as soon as I did, one could see that, you know, enslaved peoples in other colonies at other times were talking about slavery itself as a state of low intensity warfare. Right. And so I thought, well, if I think of it as war, then I'm asking questions about um, tactics and strategy and territorial claims uh, and recruiting that are not the first questions one asks when one thinks more broadly about resistance. And so a kind of military history of this revolt then became the window onto seeing it, as I say, as a war within these other wars. And I discovered that, you know, some of these Africans who were involved in the slave revolt happened to also be involved in the Seven Years' War in other ways. So one of the major figures that I wrote about actually served on a British Royal Navy warship as a slave to a Royal Navy sea captain for about a year and was engaged in battles with the Spanish and the French before he was put on that sea captain's plantation as a driver, where he then became one of the principal leaders of this largest slave revolt in the 18th century British Empire, right? So seeing him as a soldier recruited to perform different roles in the various wars around the Atlantic world became a way of seeing this, this revolt differently, not just as a kind of extreme example of resistance, but as a different kind of thing unto itself that was, you know, better integrated into the study of warfare. We have a couple of questions that um, are asking about process. So your research process, your writing processes, um, uh, which I think is interesting. And this is, I think, a question that maybe um, we wouldn't have got from students um, 10 years ago, but um, Lucy Fleckenstein and, and uh, Chloe McGuire wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, maybe give us an anecdote about your process. Hmm. What do you got, Professor Cars? <laughs> well, um, I think that part of my uh, process was to uh, look at all these different, these 900 uh, interrogations, and I very laboriously made, um, I, I put them all in a database, <laughs> FileMaker Pro, that helped a lot, but I also uh, put them in spreadsheets where I would write down 
where people were from, who accused them, what they were accused of, whether they confessed, blah, 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 and, uh, and cross-referenced them all. And that gave me a, a, a very rich database it, to create stories from, because I really, as I said before, I really wanted to create stories. Um, I was uh, uh, as interested in the military aspects, but also sort of in the in the home front war, if if we can make that uh, analogy. So, by by using both the database and the spreadsheets, I was able to see linkages among people and see. Be, I was able to correlate their stories, because obviously, uh, judicial records are problematic. Right, they are obtained under duress. People have every reason to lie. Uh, people might be trying to implicate each other. Um, uh, these are also uh, interrogations that were uh, written up in the third person. Uh, often the clerk would say, "Oh, he said a lot more, but it wasn't relevant," and then he wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be written down. So even though I had fantastic sources, like all sources, they had their problems. And so part of the process was to figure out what kind of stories I could create and what kind of stories I, cre I could create that would allow me to take some people all the way from the beginning of the book to the end. And then the second part of the process that was particularly interesting to me was trying to write it up so that regular folks, uh, Professor Crawford's family members, for instance, she <laughs> talked about and friends, but also my family members and friends would want to read the book and, and get something valuable out of it. And that meant that I, by the end, had to do a lot of cutting. I spent the last year cutting 50,000 words. And I have told my students before, and I'm teaching the capstone at the moment, I tell my capstone students, my big test was, Wherever I read my own work and my own eyes glazed over, I knew that stuff had to go. And a lot of the time my eyes glazed over. And then I reread the book, I still have a moment of glazing every once in a while. But on the whole, I think that really helped. So in terms of the historian's work, it had to do with figuring out how to use these sources and extract what to me were the most interesting and meaningful stories out of it, and then finding a way to talk about it that would be both compelling, but also do justice to the people involved and to their struggle and not make it too voyeuristic. So there, there were a lot of things in play. You want to add anything to that, Dr. Brown? Sure. I mean, I thought that was a fantastic answer, and I can I, I, I kind of share many of those impulses and many of those struggles in trying to tell a story that's kind of both complex and dynamic, uh, conceptually interesting, but also intelligible and accessible. Um, and 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 Professor Carr has 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 achieved kind of magnificently in that. I would only add that one of the things that I knew I wanted to tell what was largely a spatial story. That my impulse here was to really integrate the different regions of the Atlantic world, as I said, in ways that, you know, people had asserted before, but I thought hadn't been illustrated um, uh, as well as they as they needed to be. And so, you know, the question of space and mapping and movement became what I wanted to write through. And so, you know, my database were was a spatial database where I took everything I knew about the revolt and tried to locate every place name, every movement on an 18th century map. And you know, I, when I finally did that, it's like kind of my timeline on a map, I wound up putting that on the web, which wound up helping me write the revolt later. So I could write things in sequence as they evolved across the landscape. <clears throat> so that was very important to me to really see um, the revolt playing out across space in a way that I thought would tie these different places together in people's imaginations. And I guess the only thing I would add to that is for that, um, I have an interest in cinema and filmmaking. And you know, cinema is the, you know, in some ways, the kind of art and rhetoric of space, of trying to figure out how one takes space in three dimensions and render it in two dimensions dynamically over time. And so um, the techniques of filmmakers, which involve changing the scale from the close up to the wide shot to the panorama, became very important in my writing process, which was always to think about, you know, where do I want the frame to be in this particular sequence? And when does the frame need to widen? And when do I need to go closer in order to illustrate the kinds of things I'm trying to do so that I can tell a st story that scales 
from the intimate to the the panoramic or the trans imperial the transcontinental we have two master crafts people with us here today folks so <laughs> these, these are just excellent answers i want to wind us up with a question from another duke historian uh who has uh webexed in professor woody holton and he's going to give you a tough one so he says uh could both of you compare the impacts of the two revolts so impact it seems tacky's revolt led to a temporary cessation of the so-called african trade similar to what white north americans did after slave revolts while the berbice revolt led to the dutch government to take berbice into its own hands which also happened in north america where Native American revolts led the crown to take over Virginia and later both Carolinas, which had been proprietary colonies. So we're bringing it back to the U.S. Uh, what do your comparisons show you? Well, I may have I may have misspoke if I said that, that there was a cessation of, of, of the African trade during Tacky's revolt. What it what it what it did was it inspired a fear of Africans, which helped to animate some of the early anti-slave trade campaigners. But in fact, after the Seven Years' War, when Britain took so much territory from the France, from from France, um, the, the the slave trade boosted um, for for a few decades. So, kind of the, the best years of the British slave trade and of profits from slavery are in fact ahead of Britain uh, in through through the end of the 19th century. But we're also then stimulating the anti-slave trade movement during those years as well, and Tacky's revolt played a role in that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that I quite understand Professor Holton's question. Um, certainly in Berbice, after the end of the revolt, uh, uh, slaveholders tried to import as many new people as they possibly could, but they were never able to get the colony to be terribly profitable again. So in that respect, the enslaved had done enormous damage. Um, and the Dutch couldn't really recover for that from that. But when Berbice became English, it became for a short period one of the crown jewels of the British Empire um, with, uh, with the, the increased production of sugar and huge numbers of people being imported. And then there is a new revolt uh, in Berbice uh, in, uh, or in Guyana then, uh, British Guyana. Uh, that uh, that uh, Randy Brown has has written about, among other people. Um, so, it, yes, I, I'm not sure what I can say about the impact. It, it's true that the Dutch take over Berbice, but I think the more important thing is that the the Dutch the Dutch state never recovers the money that they expend on the part of the company of the of Berbice, and the company of Berbice is never able to become a, a, a profitable company again. So even though it appears initially that slavery is just reinstated and, and sort of goes on as it had, um, and the Dutch make some noises about amelioration and stuff, but that, that really doesn't work out very well at all. Um, the longer term impact is, is actually uh, quite, quite substantial, mm -hmm. but I'm not so, quite sure that that is what, what Woody was asking about. So I, this is a place where I wish, you know, Professor Holton could actually join us on screen because I have questions for him. This is an opportunity, I think, with him here to really geek out again, kind of on this question and this period. And maybe if I'm asking the question, he can type really fast to get his answer back in and we can hear it from Dr. Freud. But one of the things that has been happening, you know, at least in the United States um, in the last year or so, is this conversation about why the North Americans rebelled and how much their rebellion against the British had to do with protecting slavery. Mm -hmm. Now, Professor Holton's earlier book, um, uh, Force Founders, is really kind of one of the sources that people have drawn upon to make that argument because he shows how um, the Virginians especially, right, um, both wanted to, uh, were, 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 were upset about their debts to British merchants, they were upset about um, the, uh, the kind of uh, limitations on, on their expansion into Native American lands. Um, and that they were upset finally about Lord Dunmore's 1775 proclamation that encouraged the enslaved to rebel um, uh, if, if, the, if, the, if the colonists continued in their rebellions that were starting in the 1770s. Now, I feel like when you look at the Caribbean, 
you throw that, that, that conversation into some kind of confusion. Because of course, the Jamaican planters right, had far more at stake, everything at stake in the defense of slavery, right? They didn't like the Stamp Act either, but for them having more British troops stationed at Jamaica was their way of defending slavery, not having fewer. And so I wonder if Professor Holton could type in for us how he feels his book is being used in the context of that larger debate over why the American Revolution happened in North America, but also why it didn't happen in Jamaica and Barbados and those other ter territories that had more to defend uh, from the profits of slaveholding. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, Dr. Holton could be unmuted for a minute because, you know, um, Dr. Brown, he is about to publish a major book on the American Revolution. He just sent in his very last revisions. It's in copy edit, so it will come out in a month or two. It's very long, I think 600 pages. So I'm sure he has an answer for you, but whether he can type it that fast, I'm not sure. He's got, a, he's got a quick one here, although I don't know if it's to, to Dr. Brown's question, but he says, uh, you know, you and I, I, th I think it's Dr. Brown, uh, <laughs> agree about Dunmore's proclamation. But I think the 1619 project, despite its many virtues, exaggerates the strength of anti-slavery sentiment in Britain in the 1760s and 70s. So interesting. So we, we, we agree on that. I, 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 we agree on that. I had wondered when I, when I met him uh, several weeks ago what his view on that was, but I didn't have a chance to ask him. Thanks, so, Woody. <laughs> unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap things up here, but it seems to me that we need to have like a, a second coffee session where y you can all geek out on. Uh, <laughs> on... <laughs> we'll have, you, should, you shouldn't put us together like this. You shouldn't put us, yeah, you know what you're going to get. That's right. We'll do more of a WebEx just meeting and meet in somebody's personal room and hang out. But I think this is a great example of how, for, for the audience, of how historians really enjoy getting together and talking about these things. So this was so much fun. I'm not sure we should ever go back to one low speaker again. I really like the panel format. And I want to bring Dr. Crawford back in and see if she mm -hmm. wants to say anything because um, she did the hard job of moderating. <laughs> no, I, I, I wanted to close um, with, well, there were two questions, but I think one of the two questions actually might keep us going, so I'm not going to um, pose that one. And I want to kind of think about, um, you know, with my students at the Naval Academy, you know, because they're going to be officers, most of whom um, are not history major majors, but they do take um, a number of history courses, they're always trying to figure out, you know, you know, well, this is quite interesting. I didn't know this, I hadn't learned this, you know, but what can I take away <laughs> from how it applies today? Is there anything, right? You know, there's just this kind of um, deep desire to kind of have this applicability. But, you know, I suspect that there are some lessons, right, that can be taken <laughs> actually from <laughs> your works, um, which are, you know, dealing with the 18th century, dealing with, you know, institutions and um, resistance to um, the brutality of slavery um, and um, looking at individuals who are supposed to be marginalized and silenced, but who have political visions and projects and are actualizing them. And I wanted to end um, with you both perhaps speaking to any kinds of connections that you think um, your work can speak to. I, to some degree, I think, um, you know, Marolaine has talked about how in, in the Netherlands, perhaps because of Black Lives Matter internationally, there is a re-engagement with questions. Dr. Holton talked about the 1619 Project. That is very much um, in the forefront today. But I would leave it open to you both um, to perhaps, um, perhaps close with some, some remarks um, with how this project that you just produced um, can help us think through, sort out, um, existing questions, problems, or issues that, you know, everyday people are facing today? Well, you won't be surprised that as a social historian, I think, you know, one needs to look at where these books are being read and interpreted and what they're being used for by particular people. And so that turns out to be different in the United States than in, say, Jamaica, where my book has kind of entered a conversation about whether Tacky and his fellow rebels should be recognized as national heroes uh, within Jamaica. Now, in the book that I've written, right, it's not just about Tacky, even though Tacky is in the title, it's about a whole host of figures um, who staged this revolt. But the book has been taken up in this long-running campaign uh, 
to uh, to actually recognize the revolt and recognize Taki as a national hero alongside you know speakers like Sam Sharp uh, and Manny <clears throat> or Paul Vogel. There's an activist that I've been corresponding with named uh, uh, Jamaica Derek Black X Robinson, uh, who has been walking across the island for about 15 years, often wearing a heavy, heavy chain around his neck to try and dramatize these events to commemorate them. Um, and the book has now kind of been swept up as part of that campaign. But as Professor Carr said, um, it also really kind of plays a role in how people talk about racial politics. And for that, more generally, I would just say, look, this is how the Americas got made. <laughs> this is how our modern world came to be. It's no accident that, you know, Jamaica was the most profitable colony in the British Empire. It's no accident that wherever European uh, uh, colonists found ways to exploit slavery, their colonies thrived, right? That's how the entire enterprise worked by the slave trade. And it created enduring patterns of inequality that are with us today, right? Kind of, you know, for, for Americans to disavow, right, British efforts elsewhere in the world, for Northerners to disavow what's happening in the South, despite the kind of connections between Northern and Northern capital and Southern agriculture, for, you know, people in the Netherlands to disavow what happened in South Africa and disavow what happened in Suriname and Curaçao and Berbice, right? is not to recognize this common history that made the world the way it is today. And that's a problem when people still want to talk about George Washington and talk about Thomas Jefferson without talking about their slaves, right? If we're going to forget, we can forget it all. But if you still want to talk about George Washington, I do want to talk about his slaves too. Otherwise, we're not really understanding our common history and we can't deal with our common problems. Nothing to add there, Dr. Crawford. <laughs> you, you, you put it very nicely. I, I think the, the reverberations of that 18th century, 17th and 18th century world in terms of race relations and politics today is to me the most important thing. Well, I thank you both. Um, I was I was kind of saying, "Amen, brother." That was what I was saying. Um, muted as you were, um, for, you know, providing a remarks. Um, I just want to thank you both um, for giving me an opportunity to join in and and also geek out with you both. Um, I had so many other questions that I'd love to ask, um, but we can do it offline. Um, it's been a pleasure, and I really hope those of you who are in attendance who haven't picked up the books. Um, you should definitely do so, um, you know, order them online, you know, um, if you can get to your bookstore and they're there, um, please pick them up. They're, they're amazing, fascinating um, reads um, and they really change the way you think um, about questions of um, slavery and freedom and um, ways in which to res resist. And so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, I thank wanna you. thank you for hosting so well and thank at University of Maryland at Baltimore um, this was like March Madness for us Dukies. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't get to go to the tourney this year. But this was our March Madness. <laughs> it was great. Thank you very much, Vince. Thank you very much, Sharika. If I may go back to first names, and thank you also to Christine and Amy and Amy Barnes. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. <laughs>